The Tiger, the Brahmin, and the Jackal from Indian Fairy Tales, selected and edited by Joseph Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tiger, the Brahmin, and the Jackal Recording by Sindhu Once upon a time, a tiger was caught in a trap. He tried in vain to get out through the bars, and rolled and bit with rage and grief when he failed. By chance, a poor Brahmin came by. Let me out of this cage, O pious one, cried the tiger. Nay, my friend, replied the Brahmin mildly. You would probably eat me if I did. Not at all, swore the tiger with many oaths. On the contrary, I shall be forever grateful and serve you as a slave. Now when the tiger sobbed and sighed and wept and swore, the pious Brahmin's heart softened, and at last he consented to open the door of the cage. Out popped the tiger, and seizing the poor man, cried, What a fool you are! What is to prevent my eating you now? For after being cooped up so long, I'm just terribly hungry. In vain the Brahmin pleaded for his life. The most he could gain was a promise to abide by the decision of the first three things he chose to question as to the justice of the tiger's action. So the Brahmin first asked a people tree what it thought of the matter, but the people tree replied coldly, What have you to complain about? Don't I give shade and shelter to everyone who passes by? And don't they in return tear down my branches to feed their cattle? Don't whimper. Be a man. Then the Brahmin, sad at heart, went further afield till he saw a buffalo turning a well wheel. But he fared no better from it, for it answered, You are a fool to expect gratitude. Look at me. Whilst I gave milk, they fed me on cotton seed and oil cake. But now I am dry, they yoke me here and give me refuse as fodder. The Brahmin, still more sad, asked the road to give him its opinion. My dear sir, said the road, how foolish you are to expect anything else. Here am I, useful to everybody, yet all, rich and poor, great and small, trample on me as they go past giving me nothing but the ashes of their pipes and the husks of their grain. On this the Brahmin turned back sorrowfully, and on the way he met a jackal, who called out, Why, what's the matter, Mr. Brahmin? You look as miserable as a fish out of water. The Brahmin told him all that had occurred. How very confusing, said the jackal, when the recital was ended. Would you mind telling me over again? for everything has got so mixed up. The Brahmin told it all over again, but the jackal shook his head in a distracted sort of way and still could not understand. It's very odd, said he sadly, but it all seems to go in at one year and out the other. I will go to the place where it all happened, and then perhaps I shall be able to give a judgment. So they returned to the cage, by which the tiger was waiting for the Brahmin and sharpening his teeth and claws. You've been away a long time, growled the savage beast, but now let's begin our dinner. Our dinner, thought the wretched Brahmin, as his knees knocked together with fright. What a remarkably delicate way of putting it. Give me five minutes, my lord, he pleaded, in order that I may explain matters to the jackal here, who is somewhat slow in his wits. The tiger consented, and the Brahmin began the whole story over again, not missing a single detail, and spinning as long a yarn as possible. Oh, my poor brain, oh, my poor brain, cried the jackal, wringing its paws. Let me see, how did it all begin? You were in the cage, and the tiger came walking by. Pooh, interrupted the tiger. What a fool you are. I was in the cage. Of course, cried the jackal, pretending to tremble with fright. Yes, I was in the cage. No, I wasn't. Dear, dear, where are my wits? Let me see. The tiger was in the Brahmin, and the cage came walking by. No, that's not it either. 
Well, don't mind me, but begin your dinner, for I shall never understand. Yes, you shall, returned the tiger, in a rage at the jackal's stupidity. I'll make you understand. Look here, I am the tiger. Yes, my lord. And that is the brahmin. Yes, my lord. And that is the cage. Yes, my lord. And I was in the cage. Do you understand? Yes. No. Please, my lord. Well, cried the tiger impatiently. Please, my lord, how did you get in? How? Why, in the usual way, of course. Oh, dear me, my head is beginning to whirl again. Please don't be angry, my lord. But what is the usual way? At this, the tiger lost patience and, jumping into the cage, cried, This way! Now do you understand how it was? Perfectly, grinned the jackal, as he dexterously shut the door. And if you will permit me to say so, I think matters will remain as they were. End of The Tiger, the Brahmin, and the Jackal Selected and edited by Joseph Jacobs How the Cobbler Cheated the Devil In Folklore and Legends by Charles John Tibbets This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jay Gatling. How the Cobbler Cheated the Devil It chanced that once upon a time long years ago, in the days when strange things used to happen in the world, and the devil himself used sometimes to walk about in it in a bare-faced fashion, to the distraction of all good and bad folk alike, he came to a very small town, where he resolved to stay a while to play some of his tricks. How it was, whether the people were better or were worse than he expected to find them, whether they would not give way to him, or whether they went beyond him and outwitted him, I don't know, and so cannot say. But sure it is that in a short while he became terribly angry with the folk, and at length was so disgusted that he threatened he would make them repent their treatment of him, for he would punish them in a manner which should show them his power. With that he flew off in a fury, and the folk, knowing with whom they had to deal, were very sad, thinking what terrible thing would overtake them, and at their wit's end, to imagine how they might manage to escape the claws of the evil one. Accordingly it was decided to call a meeting of the townsfolk, to which all, old and young, should come to deliver their opinion as to the best course to be pursued. Only those too old to walk, the sick and the foolish being not called to the council. Very many different courses were proposed, and while these were being debated, a man rushed into the hall where the council was held, and informed them that their enemy was coming, for he had himself seen him making his way to the town, bearing on his shoulder a stone almost big enough to bury the place under it. He reported that the devil was yet a long way off, for his load hampered him sadly and he could not travel fast. What to do the councillors did not know, when suddenly there came amongst them a poor cobbler, whom they had forgot to call to the meeting, for he was indeed looked upon as only half-witted. "'I will go and meet him,' said he, "'and stop him coming here.' "'You stop him!' cried they all. "'It's mad you must be to think of it.' Oh, go the same, said the cobbler, and without saying a word more, he goes out and begins to make ready for his journey. First of all, he collected together as many old boots and shoes as he could find, and when he had got them all in a bundle, he finds out the man who had seen the devil coming on, and inquired of him the way he should go to meet him. The man told him the road, and the cobbler set out. He walked and walked and walked, till at last he came to the devil who was sitting by the roadside, resting himself, and trying to get cool, for the day was warm, and he was nearly worn out with carrying the big rock which lay beside him. "'Do you know such and such a place?' asks he of the man, naming the town he would be at. "'I do indeed,' says the man, "'for I ought to, seeing as I have lived in its neighbourhood these many years, and have only left there to travel here.' And how many days have you been getting here? asked the devil anxiously, for he had hoped he was near the end of his journey. 
Oh, days and days, replies the man. See here. And he opens his bundle of old boots that he had ready. See here, says he. These are the boots I've worn out on the hard road in coming from the place here. Have you indeed, says the devil, looking at them amazed, little thinking that the man was lying as he showed him pair after pair, all in holes and shreds. Well, indeed, it must be a long way off. And he looks around him, and then at the rock, and thinks what a terrible long way he has had to bring it, and begins to doubt whether, after all, since he's still got so far to go, it's worth all the trouble. If it had been near, says he, it would have been a different thing, and I would have shown them what it is to treat me as they did. But, as it's so far off, it's another matter, and I don't think it's worth the trouble. So he just takes up the rock and flings it aside in a field, and goes off back again. So the cobbler came home, and told all the townsfolk what he had done, and how he had cheated the devil. And I can assure you that they all admired his cleverness, and the joke of tricking the devil as he had. Nor did they allow him to lose in consequence of missing his day's work. End of How the Cobbler Cheated the Devil by Charles John Tibbetts Recorded by Jay Gatling Dolls and Butterflies From Myths and Legends of Japan By Frederick Hadlin Davis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021. Dolls and Butterflies by Frederick Hadlin Davis I asked a charming Japanese girl, how can a doll live? Why, she answered, if you love it enough, it will live. Of Kajio Hearn The English and Japanese Doll Our English dolls, with their flaxen hair, blue eyes, and simpering faces, are certainly not a credit to the toymaker's art if they are to be regarded as bearing even a remote likeness to living children. Put in a horizontal position, something will click in their little heads and their blue eyes will close, or more correctly roll backward. A pinch will make them emit a tolerable imitation of the words papa, mama, And yet, in spite of these mechanical devices, they have nothing more to their credit than a child's short-lived love. They are speedily broken, or liable at any moment to be decapitated by a little brother who has learnt too well the story of Lady Jane Grey. In Japan, however, the doll is not merely a plaything by which little children may become make-believe mothers. But in earlier days, it was regarded as a means to make a wife a mother. Lafcadio Hearns writes, And if you see such a doll, though held quite close to you, being made by a Japanese mother to reach out its hands, to move its little bare feet, and to turn its head, you would be almost afraid to venture a heavy wager that it was only a doll. It is this startling likeness that is perhaps accountable for the quaint and beautiful love connected with Japanese dolls. Live Dolls At one time, certain dolls were actually said to become alive, to take to their small bodies a human soul, and the belief is merely an echo of the old idea that much love will quicken to life the image of a living thing. In old Japan, the doll was handed down from one generation to another, and sometimes remained in an excellent condition for over a hundred years. A hundred years spent in little children's arms, served with food, put to bed regularly every night, and the object of constant endearments will no doubt work wonders in the poetic imagination of a happy and childlike people. The tiny doll known as Ohina-sans does not come within the region of our present study. It was simply a toy and nothing more. It is the life-size dolls we must deal with, those dolls so cunningly representing little children two or three years old. The girl doll of this class is known as O Tokusan, and the boy doll as Tokutaro-san. It was believed that if these dolls were ill-treated or neglected in any way, they would weep, become angry, and bring misfortune upon their possessors. They had, in addition, many other supernatural powers. 
In a certain old family, there was a Tokutaro-san, which received a reverence almost equal to that shown to Kishibojin, the goddess to whom Japanese wives pray for offspring. This Tokutaro-san was borrowed by childless couples. They gave it new clothes and tended it with loving care, assured that such a doll, which had a soul, would make them happy by answering their prayers for a child. Tokutaro-san, according to legend, was very much alive, for when the house caught fire, it speedily ran into the garden for safety. A Doll's Last Resting Place What happens to a Japanese doll when after a very long and happy life, it eventually gets broken? Though finally regarded as dead, its remains are treated with the utmost respect. It is not thrown away with rubbish or burned or even reverently laid upon running water, as is often the case with dead Japanese flowers. It is not buried, but dedicated to Kojin, frequently represented as a deity with many arms. Kojin is supposed to reside in the Inoki tree, and in front of this tree there is a small shrine and tori. Here, then, the remains of a very old Japanese doll are reverently laid. Its little face may be scratched, its silk dress torn and faded, and its arms and legs broken. But it once had a soul. Once had the mysterious desire to give maternity to those who longed for it. On March 3rd, the girls' festival takes place. It is known as Jōmi no Sekku, or Hina Matsuri, the feast or dolls. Butterflies Where the soft drifts lie of fallen blossoms dying, did one flutter now? From earth to its brown bough? Ah no, t'was a butterfly, like fragile blossom flying. Arakira Motitake Translated by Clara A. Walsh It is in China, rather than Japan, that the butterfly is connected with legend and folklore. The Chinese scholar Rosan is said to have received visits from two spirit maidens who regaled him with ghostly stories about these bright-winged insects. It is more than probable that the legends concerning butterflies in Japan have been borrowed from China. Japanese poets and artists were fond of choosing, for their professional appellation, such names as butterfly dream, solitary butterfly, butterfly help, and so on. Though probably of Chinese origin, such ideas naturally appealed to the aesthetic taste of the Japanese people, and no doubt they played in early days the romantic game of butterflies. The Emperor Genso used to make butterflies choose his loves for him. At a wine party in his garden, fair ladies would set caged butterflies free. These bright-colored insects would fly and settle upon the fairest damsels, and those maidens immediately received royal favors. Butterflies of Good and Evil Omen In Japan, the butterfly was at one time considered to be the soul of a living man or woman. If it entered a guest room and pitched behind the bamboo screen, it was a sure sign that the person whom it represented would shortly appear in the house. The presence of a butterfly in the house was regarded as a good omen, though of course everything depended on the individual typified by the butterfly. The butterfly was not always the harbinger of good. When Taira no Masakado was secretly preparing for a revolt, Kyoto was the scene of a swarm of butterflies, and the people who saw them were much frightened. Lafcadio Hearn suggests that these butterflies may have been the spirits of those fated to fall in battle, the spirits of the living who were stirred by a premonition of the near approach of death. Butterflies may also be the souls of the dead, and they often appear in this form in order to announce their final leave-taking from the body. The Flying Hairpin of Kocho the Japanese drama contains reference to the ghostly significance of butterflies. In the play known as The Flying Hairpin of Kocho, the heroine Kocho kills herself on account of false accusations and cruel treatment. Her lover seeks to discover who has been the cause of her untimely death. Eventually, Kocho's hairpin turns into a butterfly and hovers over the hiding place of the villain who has caused all the trouble the white butterfly. There is a quaint and touching Japanese legend connected with the butterfly. An old man named Takahama lived in a little house behind the cemetery of the temple of Sozanji, 
He was extremely amiable and generally liked by his neighbors, though most of them considered him to be a little mad. His madness, it would appear, entirely rested upon the fact that he had never married or evidenced desire for intimate companionship with women. One summer day, he became very ill, so ill, in fact, that he sent for his sister-in-law and her son. They both came and did all they could to bring comfort during his last hours. While they watched, Takahama fell asleep. But he had no sooner done so than a large white butterfly flew into the room and rested on the old man's pillow. The young man tried to drive it away with a fan, but it came back three times, as if loth to leave the sufferer. At last, Takahama's nephew chased it out into the garden, through the gate, and into the cemetery beyond, where it lingered over a woman's tomb, and then mysteriously disappeared. On examining the tomb, the young man found the name Akiko written upon it, together with a description narrating how Akiko died when she was 18. Though the tomb was covered with moss and must have been erected 50 years previously, the boy saw that it was surrounded with flowers, and that the little water tank had been recently filled. When the young man returned to the house, he found that Takahama had passed away, and he returned to his mother and told her what he had seen in the cemetery. Akiko? murmured his mother. When your uncle was young, he was betrothed to Akiko. She died of consumption shortly before her wedding day. When Akiko left this world, your uncle resolved never to marry and to live ever near her grave. For all these years he has remained faithful to his vow, and kept in his heart all the sweet memories of his one and only love. Every day Takahama went to the cemetery, whether the air was fragrant with summer breeze or thick with falling snow. Every day he went to her grave and prayed for her happiness, swept the tomb and set flowers there. When Takahama was dying, and he could no longer perform his loving task, Akiko came for him. That white butterfly was her sweet and loving soul. Just before Takahama passed away into the land of the Yellow Spring, he may have murmured words like those of Yone Noguchi. Where the flowers sleep, thank God, I shall sleep tonight. O come, butterfly. End of Frederick Hadlin Davis's Dolls and Butterflies Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021「The Sneezing Colossus of Korean Fairy Tales by William Elliot Griffiths」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lewis West Mr. Kim, who lived at the foot of the mountains, was a lazy lout. He had a family to support, but he did not like steady work. He preferred to smoke his pipe as long as a yardstick, and to wait for something to turn up. One day his wife, tired of trying to feed hungry children from empty dishes, gave her husband a good scolding and bade him be gone and get something for the household. This consisted of father, mother, and four little folks whose faces were not often washed, besides a little dog. This puppy, when danger was near, always ran into the house through a little square hole cut in the door, and when safely within, barked lustily. So Mr. Kim went out to the mountains to find something, a root of ginseng, a nugget of gold, or some precious stone perhaps if he were lucky. If not, some berries, wild grapes, or pears might do. Meanwhile at home, his wife pounded the grain that was left in the larder for the children's dinner. Mr. Kim rambled over the rocks a long time without seeing anything worth carrying away. When it was about noon, he came to one of the mighty Muryaks, or colossal stone Buddhas cut out of the solid mountain. It rose in the air many yards high. Ages ago, in the days of Buddhism, when monasteries covered the land and Buddhist friars and nuns chanted Sanskrit hymns to the praise of Lord Buddha, devout men, laboring many months, chiseled this towering colossus into human form. Its nose stood out three feet. Its mouth was four feet wide. 
On its flat head was a cap made of a slab of granite and shaped like a student's mortar board in which ten men could stand without crowding one another. Long gone and forgotten were the monks, and the monastery had fallen to ruins. The forest had grown up around the great stone image until it was nearly hidden by the tall trees surrounding it. In front, from the ground up, the wild grapevines had gripped the stone with their tendrils and spread their matted branches and greenery until they nearly covered the image up to its neck. But out of a crevice in the head of the figure grew a pear tree, sprung from a seed dropped long ago by the great-grandfather of one of the birds singing and chirping nearby. And, oh joy, at the end of the outer branch was growing a ripe, luscious pear nearly as big as a man's head. What a prize! It would, when cut up, make a dessert for the whole family. Happy Kim! He blessed his lucky star. Seizing hold of the bushes and wild grapevines, by dint of great effort, Mr. Kim climbed upward and got as far as the chin of the great stone face. Above him protruded the big nose, the nostrils of which gaped like caverns. Yet although he was standing with his foot on the stone lips and holding on to the nose, despite all his exertions, he could go no further up the granite face. He was at his wit's end. Far above him hung the delicious-looking pear as if to tantalize him. A gentle breeze was swaying the fruit to and fro, and it seemed to say, Take me if you can. But the nose, being polished, was slippery, and the ears were too smooth to climb. What could he take hold of? Surely to shin up any further was impossible. Must he give up the pear? A bright thought entered his head. He would crawl up into the right nostril and hope for an exit to the top. So, thinking he might find his way, he began like an insect to enter the hole, and soon the man Kim disappeared from sight, as with hands and feet he climbed into the darkness. Wasn't it dangerous to tickle the nostrils of the great stone man in this way? But whatever Kim may have thought, he kept on, determined to get that pair, come what might. Suddenly, a blast loud enough to rend the mountain was heard. Hush! Ho! Had an earthquake or tempest taken place? Was this rolling thunder? No, the Colossus had sneezed. Thus the stone man got rid of the intruder. The first thing Mr. Kim knew, he was flying through the air, and he tumbled upon the bushes. His wits were gone. He knew nothing. This was about one o'clock in the afternoon. Mr. Kim lay asleep or unconscious till near sundown. Then he woke up and realized what had happened. There was the stone nose beetling over him, far up toward the sky. But in sneezing so hard, the colossus had shaken its head also, and the big pear had dropped off. Kim found it lying by his side, and picking it up, went on his way rejoicing. At home, the little dog looking through the square hole saw him, barked welcome, and a right merry supper they had over the big pear cut into slices, as Mr. Kim told the story of his adventures. End of The Sneezing Colossus Recording by Lewis West The Star Lovers and the Robe of Feathers from Myths and Legends of Japan by Frederick Hadlin Davis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021. The Star Lovers and the Robe of Feathers by Frederick Hadlin Davis. One of the most romantic of the old Japanese festivals is the festival of Tanabata, the Weaving Lady. It takes place on the seventh day of the seventh month, and on this occasion it was customary to place freshly cut bamboos either on the roof of houses or to fix them in the ground close behind them. Colored strips of paper were attached to these bamboos, and upon every strip of paper was a poem in praise of Tanabata and her husband, Hikoboshi, such as as Tanabata slumbers with her long sleeves rolled up, until the reddening of dawn, do not, O storks of the river shallows, 
awaken her by your cries. This festival will more readily be understood when we have described the legend in connection with it. The god of the firmament had a lovely daughter by name, and she spent her time in weaving for her august father. One day, while she sat at her loom, she chanced to see a handsome lad leading an ox, and she immediately fell in love with him. Tanabata's father, reading her secret thoughts, speedily consented to their marriage. Unfortunately, however, they loved not wisely but too well, with the result that Tanabata neglected her weaving, and Hikoboshi's ox was allowed to wander at large over the high plain of heaven. The god of the firmament became extremely angry and commanded that these two ardent lovers should henceforth be separated by the celestial river. On the seventh night of the seventh month, provided the weather was favorable, a great company of birds formed a bridge across the river, and by this means the lovers were able to meet. Their all-too-brief visit was not even a certainty, for if there were rain, the celestial river would become too wide for even a great bridge of magpies to span, and the lovers would be compelled to wait another weary year before there was even a chance of meeting each other again. No wonder that on the festival of the weaving maiden, little children should sing, Tenkini nadi, O weather be clear. Love laughs at locksmiths in our own country, but the celestial river in flood is another matter. When the weather is fine and the star lovers meet each other after a weary year's waiting, it is said that the stars, possibly Lyra and Aquila, shine with five different colors. Blue, green, red, yellow, and white. And that is why the poems are written on paper of these colors. The Robe of Feathers O oh, magic strains that fill our ravished ears! The fairy sings, and from the cloudy spheres, Chiming in unison the angels' lutes, Tabrets and cymbals and sweet silvery flutes, Ring through the heaven that glows with purple hues, And when Samiro's western slope endues, the tints of sunsets while the azure wave, From isle to isle the pine-clad shores doth lave. From Yukishima's slope a beauteous storm, Whirl down the flowers and still that magic form. Those snowy pinions fluttering in the light, Ravish our shoals with wonder and delight. Ha Goromo, translated by B. H. Chamberlain. It was springtime, and along Mio's pine-clad shore there came a sound of birds. The blue sea danced and sparkled in the sunshine. And Haruko, a fisherman, sat down to enjoy the scene. As he did so, he chanced to see, hanging on a pine tree, a beautiful robe of pure white feathers. As Haruko was about to take down the robe, he saw coming toward him from the sea an extremely lovely maiden who requested that the fisherman would restore the robe to her. Haiduko gazed upon the lady with considerable admiration. Said he, I found this robe, and I mean to keep it, for it is a marvel to be placed among the treasures of Japan. No, I cannot possibly give it to you. Oh, cried the maiden pitifully, I cannot go soaring into the sky without my robe of feathers, for if you persist in keeping it, I can never more return to my celestial home. O oh, good fisherman, I beg of you to restore my robe. The fisherman, who must have been a hard-hearted fellow, refused to relent. The more you plead, said he, the more determined I am to keep what I have found. Thus the maiden made answer. Speak not, dear fisherman, speak not that word. Ah, knowest thou not that? Like the hapless bird, whose wings are broke, I seek but seek in vain. Reft of my wings to soar to heaven's blue plain? Translated by B. H. Chamberlain. After further argument on the subject, the fisherman's heart softened a little. I will restore your robe of feathers, said he, if you will at once dance before me. Then the maiden replied, I will dance it here, the dance that makes the place of the moon turn round, so that even poor transitory men may learn its mysteries, but I cannot dance without my feathers. No, said the fisherman suspiciously. If I give you this robe, you will fly away without dancing before me. This remark made the maiden extremely angry. The pledge of mortals may be broken, said she, but there is no falsehood among the heavenly beings. Those words put the fisherman to shame, and without more ado, he gave the maiden her robe of feathers. 
The Moon Lady's Song When the maiden had put on her pure white garment, she struck a musical instrument and began to dance. And while she danced and played, she sang of many strange and beautiful things concerning her faraway home in the moon. She sang of the mighty palace of the moon, where thirty monarchs ruled, fifteen in robes of white, when that shining orb was full, and fifteen robes in black, when the moon was waning. As she sang and played and danced, she blessed Japan. That earth may still her proper increase yield. The fishermen did not long enjoy this kind of exhibition of the moon lady's skill, for very soon her dainty feet ceased to tap upon the sand. She rose into the air, the white feathers of her robe gleaming against the pine trees or against the blue sky itself. Up, up she went, still playing and singing, past the summits of the mountains, higher and higher, until her song was hushed, until she reached the glorious palace of the moon. End of Frederick Hadland Davis's The Star Lovers and the Robe of Feathers Recording by Joanna Schreck, Indianapolis, January 2021「The Quest of Medusa's Head」in「Old Greek Stories」by James Baldwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Nick Vlaharkas The Quest of Medusa's Head 1. The Wooden Chest There was a king of Argos who had but one child, and that child was a girl. If he had had a son, he would have trained him up to be a brave man and great king, but he did not know what to do with this fair-haired daughter. When he saw her growing up to be tall and slender and wise, he wondered if, after all, he would have to die some time and leave his lands and his gold and his kingdom to her. So he sent to Delphi and asked the Pythia about it. The Pythia told him that he would not only have to die some time, but that the son of his daughter would cause his death. This frightened the king very much, and he tried to think of some plan by which he could keep the Pythia's words from coming true. At last he made up his mind that he would build a prison for his daughter and keep her in it all her life. So he called his workmen and had them dig a deep, round hole in the ground, and in this hole they built a house of brass, which he had but one room and no door at all, but only a small window at the top. When it was finished, the king put the maiden, whose name was Thania, into it, and with her he put her nurse and her toys and her pretty dresses, and everything that he thought she would need to make her happy. Now we shall see that the Pythia does not always tell the truth, he said. So Thania was kept shut up in the prison of brass. She had no one to talk to but her old nurse. And she never saw the land or the sea, but only the blue sky above the open window, and now and then a white cloud sailing across. Day after day she sat under the window and wondered why her father kept her in that lonely place, and whether he would ever come and take her out. I do not know how many years passed by, but Vania grew fairer every day, and by and by she was no longer a child, but a tall and beautiful woman. And Jupiter amid the clouds looked down and saw her and loved her. One day it seemed to her that the sky opened, and a shower of gold fell through the window into the room. And when the blinding shower had ceased, a noble young man stood smiling before her. She did not know, nor do I, that it was a mighty Jupiter who had thus come down in the rain. But she thought that he was a brave prince who had come from over the sea to take her out of her prison house. After that, he came often but always as a tall and handsome youth, and by and by they were married, with only the nurse at the wedding feast, and Thania was so happy that she was no longer lonesome, even when he was away. But one day, when he climbed out through the narrow window, there was a great flash of light, 
and she never saw him again. Not long afterwards, a babe was born to Thania, a smiling boy whom she named Perseus. For four years, she and the nurse kept him hidden, and not even the women who brought their food to the window knew about him. But one day, the king chanced to be passing by and heard the child's prattle. When he learned the truth, he was very much alarmed, for he thought that now, in spite of all that he had done, the words of the Pythia might come true. The only sure way to save himself would be to put the child to death before he was old enough to do any harm. But when he had taken the little Perseus and his mother out of the prison and had seen how helpless the child was, he could not bear the thought of having him killed outright. For the king, although a great coward, was really a kind-hearted man and did not like to see anything suffer pain. Yet something must be done. So he bade his servants make a wooden chest that was roomy and watertight and strong, and when it was done, he put Vania and the child into it and had it taken far out to sea and left there to be tossed about by the waves. He thought that in this way he would rid himself of both daughter and grandson without seeing them die, for surely the chest would sink after a while or else the winds would cause it to drift to some strange shore so far away that they could never come back to Argos again. All day and all night, and then another day, fair Thania and her child drifted over the sea. The waves rippled and played before and around the floating chest. The west wind whistled cheerily, and the seabirds circled in the air above, and the child was not afraid but dipped his hand in the curling waves and laughed at the merry breeze and shouted back at the screaming birds. But on the second night, all was changed. A storm arose, the sky was black, the billows were mountain high, the winds roared fearfully. Yet through it all, the child slept soundly in his mother's arms, and Thania sang over him this song. Sleep, sleep, dear child, and take your rest Upon your troubled mother's breast For you can lie without one fear Of dreadful danger lurking near Wrapped in soft robes and warmly sleeping You do not hear your mother weeping. You do not see the mad waves leaping. Nor heed the winds their vigils keeping. The stars are hid, the night is drear. The waves beat high, the storm is here. But you can sleep. My darling child, and know naught of the uproar wild. At last the morning of the third day came, and the chest was tossed upon the sandy shore of a strange island, where there were green fields, and beyond them a little town. A man who happened to be walking near the shore saw it and dragged it far up on the beach. Then he looked inside, and there he saw the beautiful lady and the little boy. He helped them out and led them just as they were to his own house, where he cared for them very kindly. And when Vania had told him her story, he bade her feel no more fear, for they might have a home with him as long as they should choose to stay, and he would be a true friend to them both. 2. The Magic Slippers So Thania and her son stayed in the house of the kind man who had saved them from the sea. Years passed by, and Perseus grew up to be a tall young man, handsome and brave and strong. The king of the island, when he saw Thania, was so pleased with her beauty that he wanted her to become his wife. But he was a dark, cruel man, and she did not like him at all. So she told him that she would not marry him. The king thought that Perseus was to blame for this, and that if he could find some excuse to send the young man on a far journey, he might force Thania to have him whether she wished or not. One day he called all the young men of his country together, and told them that he was soon to be wedded to the queen of a certain land beyond the sea. 
Would not each of them bring him a present to be given to her father? For in those times it was the rule that when any man was about to be married, he must offer costly gifts to the father of the bride. What kind of presents do you want? said the young men. Horses, he answered, for he knew that Perseus had no horse. Why don't you ask for something worth the having? said Perseus, for he was vexed at the way in which the king was treating him. Why don't you ask for Medusa's head, for example? Medusa's head it shall be, cried the king. These young men may give me horses, but you shall bring me Medusa's head. I will bring it, said Perseus, and he went away in anger, while his young friends laughed at him because of his foolish words. What was this Medusa's head which he had so rashly promised to bring? His mother had often told him about Medusa. Far, far away on the very edge of the world, there lived three strange monsters, sisters, called Gorgons. They had the bodies and faces of women, but they had wings of gold and terrible claws of brass, and hair that was full of living serpents. They were so awful to look upon that no man could bear the sight of them, but whoever saw their faces was turned to stone. Two of these monsters had charmed lives, and no weapon could ever do them harm. But the youngest, whose name was Medusa, might be killed if indeed anybody could find her and could give the fatal stroke. When Perseus went away from the king's palace, he began to feel sorry that he had spoken so rashly. For how should he ever make good his promise and do the king's bidding? He did not know which way to go to find the Gorgons, and he had no weapon with which to slay the terrible Medusa. But at any rate, he would never show his face to the king again, unless he could bring the head of terror with him. He went down to the shore, and stood looking out over the sea, towards Argos, his native land. And while he looked, the sun went down, and the moon arose, and a soft wind came blowing from the west. Then all at once, two persons, a man and a woman, stood before him. Both were tall and noble. The man looked like a prince, and there were wings on his cap and on his feet, and he carried a winged staff, around which two golden serpents were twined. He asked Perseus what was the matter, and the young man told him how the king had treated him, and all about the rash words which he had spoken. Then the lady spoke to him very kindly, and he noticed that, although she was not beautiful, she had most wonderful grey eyes, and a stern but lovable face, and a queenly form. And she told him not to fear, but to go out boldly in quest of the Gorgons, for she would help him obtain the terrible head of Medusa. But I have no ship, and how should I go? said Perseus. You shall don my winged slippers, said the strange prince, and they will bear you over sea and land. Shall I go north, or south, or east, or west? asked Perseus. I will tell you, said the tall lady. You must go first to the three grey sisters, who live beyond the frozen sea in the far, far north. They have a secret which nobody knows, and you must force them to tell it to you. Ask them where you shall find the three maidens who guard the golden apples of the west. And when they shall have told you, turn about and go straight thither. The maidens will give you three things, without which you can never obtain the terrible head. And they will show you how to wing your way across the western ocean to the edge of the world, where lies the home of the Gorgons. Then the man took off his winged slippers and put them on the feet of Perseus. And the woman whispered to him to be off at once and to fear nothing, but be bold and true. And Perseus knew that she was none other than Athena, the queen of the air, and that her companion was Mercury, the lord of the summer clouds. But before he could thank them for their kindness, they had vanished in the dusky twilight. Then he leaped into the air to try the magic slippers. 3. The Grey Sisters Swifter than an eagle, Perseus flew up towards the sky. Then he turned and the magic slippers bore him over the sea straight toward the north. On and on he went, and soon the sea was passed and he came to a famous land where there were cities and towns and many people. 
and then he flew over a range of snowy mountains, beyond which were mighty forests and a vast plain where many rivers wandered, seeking for the sea. And farther on was another range of mountains, and then there were frozen marshes and a wilderness of snow, and after all the sea again, but a sea of ice. On and on he winged his way among toppling icebergs and over frozen billows and through air which the sun never warmed, and at last he came to the cavern where the three grey sisters dwelt. These three creatures were so old that they had forgotten their own age, and nobody could count the years which they had lived. The long hair which covered their heads had been grey since they were born, and they had among them only a single eye and a single tooth, which they passed back and forth from one to another. Perseus heard them mumbling and crooning in their dreary home, and he stood very still and listened. We know a secret which even the great folk who live on the mountain top can never learn. Don't we, sisters? said one. Ha ha! That we do, that we do, chattered the others. Give me the tooth, sister, that I may feel young and handsome again, said the one nearest to Perseus. And give me the eye, that I may look out and see what is going on in the busy world, said the sister who sat next to her. Ah, yes, 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 mumbled the third, as she took the tooth and the eye and reached them blindly towards the others. Then, quick as thought, Perseus leaped forward and snatched both of the precious things from her hand. Where is the tooth? Where is the eye? screamed the two, reaching out their long arms and groping here and there. Have you dropped them, sister? Have you lost them? Perseus laughed as he stood in the door of their cavern and saw their distress and terror. I have your tooth and your eye, he said, and you shall never touch them again until you teach me your secret. Where are the maidens who keep the golden apples of the western land? Which way shall I go to find them? You are young and we are old, said the grey sisters. Pray, do not deal so cruelly with us. Pity us and give us our eye. Then they wept and pleaded and coaxed and threatened. But Perseus stood a little way off and taunted them. And they moaned and mumbled and shrieked as they found that their words did not move him. Sisters, we must tell him at last, said one. Ah, yes, we must tell him, said the others. We must part with the secret to save our eye. And then they told him how he should go to reach the western land, and what road he should follow to find the maidens who kept the golden apples. When they had made everything plain to him, Perseus gave them back their eye and their tooth. Ha! Ha! they laughed. Now the golden days of youth have come again. And from that day to this, no man has ever seen the three grey sisters, nor does anyone know what became of them. But the winds still whistle through the cheerless cave, and the cold waves murmur on the shore of the wintry sea, and the ice mountains topple and crash, and no sound of living creature is heard in all that desolate land. For... The Western Maidens As for Perseus, he leaped again into the air, and the magic slippers bore him southward with the speed of the wind. Very soon he left the frozen sea behind him, and came to a sunny land where there were green forests and flowery meadows and hills and valleys, and at least a pleasant garden where were all kinds of blossoms and fruits. He knew that this was the famous western land, for the Grey Sisters had told him what he should see there. So he alighted and walked among the trees, until he came to the centre of the garden. There he saw the three maidens of the west, dancing around a tree which was full of golden apples, and singing as they danced. For the wonderful tree with its precious fruit belonged to Juno, the queen of earth and sky. It had been given to her as a wedding gift and it was the duty of the maidens to care for it, and see that no one touched the golden apples. Perseus stopped and listened to their song. We sing of the old, we sing of the new, our joys are many, our sorrows are few, singing, dancing, all hearts entrancing, we wait to welcome the good and the true. 
The daylight is waning, the evening is here. The sun will soon set, the stars will appear. Singing, dancing, all hearts entrancing. We wait for the dawn of a glad new year. The tree shall wither, the apples shall fall. Sorrow shall come, and death shall call. Alarming, grieving, all hearts deceiving. But hope shall abide to comfort us all. Soon the tale shall be told, the song shall be sung, the bow shall be broken, the harp unstrung, alarming, grieving, all hearts deceiving, till every joy to the wind shall be flung. But a new tree shall spring from the roots of the old, and many a blossom its leaves shall unfold, cheering, gladdening, with joy maddening, for its boughs shall be laden with apples of gold. Then Perseus went forward and spoke to the maidens. They stopped singing and stood still as if in alarm, but when they saw the magic slippers on his feet, they ran to him and welcomed him to the western land and to their garden. We knew that you were coming, they said, for the winds told us. But why do you come? Perseus told them of all that had happened to him since he was a child, and of his quest of Medusa's head. And he said that he had come to ask them to give him three things to help him in his fight with the Gorgons. The maidens answered that they would give him not three things, but four. Then one of them gave him a sharp sword, which was crooked like a sickle, and which she fastened to the belt at his waist. And another gave him a shield, which was brighter than any looking-glass you ever saw. And the third gave him a magic pouch, which she hung by a long strap over his shoulder. These are the three things which you must have in order to obtain Medusa's head. And now, here is a fourth for without it your quest must be in vain. And they gave him a magic cap, the cap of darkness, and when they had put it upon his head, there was no creature on the earth or in the sky, no, not even the maidens themselves that could see him. When at last he was arrayed to their liking, they told him where he would find the Gorgons, and what he should do to obtain the terrible head and escape alive. Then they kissed him and wished him good luck and bade him hasten to do the dangerous deed. And Perseus donned the cap of darkness and sped away, and away towards the farthermost edge of the earth. And the three maidens went back to their tree to sing and to dance and to guard the golden apples until the old world should become young again. 5. The Dreadful Gorgons With the sharp sword at his side and the bright shield upon his arm, Perseus flew bravely onward in search of the dreadful Gorgons, but he had the cap of darkness upon his head, and you could no more have seen him than you can see the wind. He flew so swiftly that it was not long until he had crossed the mighty ocean which encircles the earth, and had come to the sunless land which lies beyond, and then he knew, from what the maidens had told him, that the lair of the Gorgons could not be far away. He heard a sound as of someone breathing heavily, and he looked around sharply to see where it came from. Among the foul weeds which grew close to the bank of a muddy river there was something which glittered in the pale light. He flew a little nearer, but he did not dare to look straight forward, lest he should all at once meet the gaze of a gorgon and be changed into stone. So he turned around and held the shining shield before him, in such a way that by looking into it, he could see objects behind him as in a mirror. Ah, what a dreadful sight it was! Half hidden among the weeds lay the three monsters, fast asleep, with their golden wings folded about them. Their brazen claws were stretched out as though ready to seize their prey, and their shoulders were covered with sleeping snakes. The two largest of the Gorgons lay with their heads tucked under their wings, as birds hide their heads when they go to sleep. 
but the third, who lay between them, slept with her face turned up towards the sky, and Perseus knew that she was Medusa. Very stealthily he went nearer and nearer, always with his back toward the monsters, and always looking into his bright shield to see where to go. Then he drew his sharp sword, and dashing quickly downward, struck a back blow so sure, so swift, that the head of Medusa was cut from her shoulders, and the black blood gushed like a river from her neck. Quick as thought, he thrust the terrible head into his magic pouch, and leaped again into the air, and flew away with the speed of the wind. Then the two older Gorgons awoke, and rose with dreadful screams, and spread their great wings, and dashed after him. They could not see him, for the cap of darkness hid him from even their eyes, but they scented the blood of the head which he carried in the pouch, and like hounds in the chase they followed him, sniffing the air. And as he flew through the clouds he could hear their dreadful cries and the clatter of their golden wings and the snapping of their horrible jaws. But the magic slippers were faster than any wings, and in a little while the monsters were left far behind, and their cries were heard no more and Perseus flew on alone. 6. The Great Sea Beast Perseus soon crossed the ocean and came again to the land of the west. Far below him he could see the three maidens dancing around the golden tree. But he did not stop, for now that he had the head of Medusa safe in the pouch at his side, he must hasten home. Straight east he flew, over the great sea, and after a time he came to a country where there were palm trees and pyramids and a great river flowing from the south. Here, as he looked down, a strange sight met his eyes. He saw a beautiful girl chained to a rock by the seashore, and far away a huge sea beast swimming towards her to devour her. Quick as thought, he flew down and spoke to her, but as she could not see him for the cap of darkness which he wore, his voice only frightened her. Then Perseus took off his cap and stood upon the rock, and when the girl saw him with his long hair and wonderful eyes and laughing face, she thought him the handsomest young man in the world. Oh, save me, save me, she cried, as she reached out her arms towards him. Perseus drew his sharp sword and cut the chain which held her, and then lifted her high up upon the rock. But by this time the sea monster was close at hand, lashing the water with his tail and opening his wide jaws, as though he could swallow not only Perseus and the young girl, but even the rock on which they were standing. He was a terrible fellow, and yet not half so terrible as the Gorgon. As he came roaring towards the shore, Perseus lifted the head of Medusa from his pouch and held it up. And when the beast saw the dreadful face, he stopped short and was turned into stone. And men say that the stone beast may be seen in that selfsame spot to this day. Then Perseus slipped the gorgon's head back into the pouch and hastened to speak with the young girl whom he had saved. She told him that her name was Andromeda, and that she was the daughter of the king of that land. She said that her mother the queen was very beautiful and very proud of her beauty, and every day she went down to the seashore to look at her face as it was pictured in the quiet water and she had boasted that not even the nymphs who live in the sea were as handsome as she. When the sea nymphs heard about this, they were very angry, and asked great Neptune, the king of the sea, to punish the queen for her pride. So Neptune sent a sea monster to crush the king's ships, and kill the cattle along the shore, and break down all the fishermen's huts. The people were so much distressed that they sent at last to ask the Pythia what they should do, and the Pythia said there was only one way to save the land from destruction, that they must give the king's daughter, Andromeda, to the monster to be devoured. The king and the queen loved their daughter very dearly, for she was their only child, and for a long time they refused to do as the Pythia had told them. But day after day, the monster laid waste to the land and threatened to destroy not only the farms, but the towns. And so they were forced in the end to give up Andromeda to save their country. This, then, was why she had been chained to the rock by the shore and left there to perish in the jaws of the beast. While Perseus was yet talking with Andromeda, the king and the queen and a great company of people came down to the shore, weeping and tearing their hair, 
for they were sure that by this time the monster had devoured his prey. But when they saw her alive and well, and learned that she had been saved by the handsome young man who stood beside her, they could hardly hold themselves for joy. And Perseus was so delighted with Andromeda's beauty, that he almost forgot his quest, which was not yet finished. And when the king asked him what he should give him as a reward for saving Andromeda's life, he said, Give her to me for my wife. This pleased the king very much. And so, on the seventh day, Perseus and Andromeda were married, and there was a great feast in the king's palace, and everybody was merry and glad. And the two young people lived happily for some time in the land of palms and pyramids, and from the sea to the mountains nothing was talked about but the courage of Perseus and the beauty of Andromeda. 7. The Timely Rescue But Perseus had not forgotten his mother, and so one fine summer day he and Andromeda sailed in a beautiful ship to his own home, for the magic slippers could not carry both him and his bride through the air. The ship came to land at the very spot where the wooden chest had been cast so many years before, and Perseus and his bride walked through the fields towards the town. Now, the wicked king of that land had never ceased trying to persuade Vania to become his wife, but she would not listen to him, and the more he pleaded and threatened, the more she disliked him. At last, when he found that she could not be made to have him, he declared that he would kill her, and on this very morning he had started out, sword in hand, to take her life. So, as Perseus and Andromeda came into the town, whom should they meet but his mother, fleeing to the altar of Jupiter, and the king following after, intent on killing her. Thania was so frightened that she did not see Perseus, but ran right on towards the only place of safety. For it was a law of that land that not even the king should be allowed to harm anyone who took refuge on the altar of Jupiter. When Perseus saw the king rushing like a madman after his mother, he threw himself before him and bade him stop. But the king struck at him furiously with his sword. Perseus caught the blow on his shield, and at the same moment took the head of Medusa from his magic pouch. I promise to bring you a present, and here it is, he cried. The king saw it and was turned into stone, just as he stood, with his sword uplifted and that terrible look of anger and passion in his face. The people of the island were glad when they learned what had happened, for no one loved the wicked king. They were glad, too, because Perseus had come home again and had brought with him his beautiful wife, Andromeda. So, after they had talked the matter over among themselves, they went to him and asked him to be their king. But he thanked them and said that he would rule over them for one day only, and that then he would give the kingdom to another, so that he might take his mother back to her home and her kindred in distant Argos. On the morrow, therefore, he gave the kingdom to the kind man who had saved his mother and himself from the sea. And then he went on board his ship with Andromeda and Vania, and sailed away across the sea towards Argos. 8. The Deadly Coit When Vania's old father, the king of Argos, heard that a strange ship was coming over the sea with his daughter and her son on board, he was in great distress, for he remembered what the Pythia had foretold about his death. So without waiting to see the vessel, he left his palace in great haste and fled out of the country. My daughter's son cannot kill me if I will keep out of his way, he said. But Perseus had no wish to harm him, and he was very sad when he learned that his poor grandfather had gone away in fear, and without telling anyone where he was going. The people of Argos welcomed Thania to her old home, and they were very proud of her handsome son, and begged that he would stay in their city so that he might some time become their king. It happened soon afterwards that the king of a certain country not far away was holding games and giving prizes to the best runners and leapers and quoit throwers, and Perseus went thither to try his strength with the other young men of the land, for he should be able to gain a prize his name would become known all over the world. No one in that country knew who he was, but all wondered at his noble stature and his strength and skill and it was easy enough for him to win all the prizes. One day, as he was showing what he could do, he threw a heavy quoit a great deal farther than any had been thrown before. 
It fell in the crowd of lookers-on and struck a stranger who was standing there. The stranger threw up his hands and sank upon the ground, and when Perseus ran to help him, he saw that he was dead. Now this man was none other than Vanir's father, the old king of Argos. He had fled from his kingdom to save his life, and in doing so had only met his death. Perseus was overcome with grief, and tried in every way to pay honour to the memory of the unhappy king. The kingdom of Argos was now rightfully his own, but he could not bear to take it after having killed his grandfather. So he was glad to exchange with another king, who ruled over two rich cities, not far away, called Mycenae and Tyrins. And he and Andromeda lived happily in Mycenae for many years. End of The Quest of Medusa's Head by James Baldwin Recorded by Nick Vlahakis This is Hudden and Dudden and Donald O'Neary in Celtic Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Liz Peterson. Hudden and Dudden and Donald O'Neary. There was, once upon a time, two farmers, and their names were Hudden and Dudden. They had poultry in their yards, sheep on the uplands, and scores of cattle in the meadowland alongside the river. But for all that, they weren't happy. For just between their two farms, there lived a poor man by the name of Donald O'Neary. He had a hovel over his head and a strip of grass that was barely enough to keep his one cow, Daisy, from starving. And though she did her best, it was but seldom that Donald got a drink of milk or a roll of butter from Daisy. You would think there was little here to make Hudden and Dudden jealous. But so it is, the more one has, the more one wants. And Donald's neighbors lay awake of nights, scheming how they might get a hold of his little strip of grassland. Daisy, poor thing, they never thought of. She was just a bag of bones. One day, Hudden met Dudden, and they were soon grumbling as usual, and all to the tune of, if only we could get that vagabond, Donald O'Neary, out of the country. Let's kill Daisy, said Hudden at last. If that doesn't make him clear out, nothing will. No sooner said than agreed, and it wasn't dark before Hudden and Dudden crept up to the little shed where lay poor Daisy, trying her best to chew the cud, though she hadn't had as much grass in the day as would cover your hand. And when Donald came to see if Daisy was all snug for the night, the poor beast had only time to lick his hand before she died. Well, Donald was a shrewd fellow, and downhearted though he was, began to think if he could get any good out of Daisy's death. He thought, and he thought, and the next day you could have seen him trudging off early to the fair. Daisy's hide over his shoulder, every penny he had jingling in his pockets. Just before he got to the fair, he made several slits in the hide, put a penny in each slit, walked into the best inn in the town as bold as if it belonged to him, and hanging the hide up to a nail in the wall, sat down. Some of your best whiskey, says he to the landlord. But the landlord didn't like his looks. Is it fearing I won't pay you, you are, said Donald. Why, I have a hide here that gives me all the money I want. And with that, he hit it a whack with his stick, and out popped a penny. The landlord opened his eyes, as you may fancy. What do you take for that hide? It's not for sale, my good man. Will you take a gold piece? It's not for sale, I tell you. Hasn't it kept me in mind for years? And with that, Donald hit the hide another whack, and out jumped a second penny. Well, the long and short of it was that Donald let the hide go, and that very evening, who but he should walk up to Hudden's door? Good evening, Hudden. Will you lend me your best pair of scales? Hudden stared, and Hudden scratched his head, but he lent the scales. When Donald was safe at home, he pulled out his pocket full of bright gold and began to weigh each piece of the scales. But Hudden had put a lump of butter at the bottom, so the last piece of gold stuck fast to the scales when he took them back to Hudden. If Hudden had stared before, he stared ten times more now, 
and no sooner was Donald's back turned than he was off as hard as he could pelt to Dudden's. Good evening, Dudden. That vagabond, bad luck to him. You mean Donald O'Neary? And who else should I mean? He's back here weighing out sackfuls of gold. How do you know that? Here are my scales that he borrowed, and here's a gold piece still sticking to them. Off they went together, and they came to Donald's door. Donald had finished making the last pile of ten gold pieces, and he couldn't finish because a piece had stuck to the scales. In they walked, without an if you please or by your leave. Well, I never. That was all they could say. Good evening, Hudden. Good evening, Dudden. Ah, you thought you'd played me a fine trick? But you never did me a better turn in all your lives. When I found poor Daisy dead, I thought to myself, Well, her hide may fetch me something. And it did. Hides are worth their weight in gold in the market just now. Hudden nudged Dudden and Dudden winked at Hudden. Good evening, Donald O'Neary. Good evening, kind friends. The next day, there wasn't a cow or a calf that belonged to Hudden or Dudden, but her hide was going to the fair in Hudden's biggest cart, drawn by Dudden's strongest pair of horses. When they came to the fair, each one took a hide over his arm, and there they were, walking through the fair, bawling out at the top of their voices, Hides to sell! Hides to sell! Out came the tanner. How much for your hides, my good men? They're weighted gold. It's early in the day to come out of the tavern. That was all the tanner said, and back he went to his yard. Hides to sell. Fresh hides to sell. Out came the cobbler. How much for your hides, my men? They're weight in gold. Is it making a game of me you are? Take that for your pains, and the cobbler dealt Hudden a blow that made him stagger. Up the people came running, from one end of the fair to the other. What's the matter? What's the matter? cried they. Here are a couple of vagabonds selling hides at their weight in gold, said the cobbler. Hold em fast! Hold em fast! bawled the innkeeper, who was the last to come up. He was so fat. I'll wager it's one of the rogues who tricked me out of my thirty gold pieces yesterday for a wretched hide. It was more kicks than halfpence that Hudden and Dudden got before they were well on their way home again and they didn't run the slower because all the dogs of the town were at their heels. Well, as you may fancy, if they loved Donald little before, they loved him less now. What's the matter, friends? said he as he saw them tearing along, their hats knocked in and their coats torn off and their faces black and blue. Is it fighting you've been? Or mayhap you met the police? Ill luck to them. We'll police you, you vagabond. It's mighty smart you thought yourself, deluding us with your lying tales. Who deluded you? Didn't you see the gold with your own two eyes? But it was no use talking. Pay for it he must, and should. There was a meal sack handy, and into it Hudden and Dudden popped Donald O'Neary. Tied him up tight, ran a pole through the knot, and off they started for the brown lake of the bog, each with a pole end on his shoulder and Donald O'Neary between. But the brown lake was far, the road was dusty, Hudden and Dudden were sore and weary, and parched with thirst. There was an inn by the roadside. Let's go in, said Hudden. I'm dead beat. It's heavy he is, for the little he had to eat. If Hudden was willing, so was Dudden. As for Donald, you may be sure his leave wasn't asked, but he was lumped down at the inn door for all the world as if he had been a sack of potatoes. Sit still, you vagabond, said Dudden. If we don't mind waiting, you needn't. Donald held his peace, but after a while, he heard the glasses clink, and Hudden singing away at the top of his voice. I won't have her, I tell you. I won't have her, said Donald, but nobody heeded what he said. I won't have her, I tell you. I won't have her, said Donald, and this time he said it louder, but nobody heeded what he said. I won't have her, I tell you. I won't have her, said Donald, and this time he said it as loud as he could. And who won't you have? May I be so bold as to ask, said a farmer who had just come up with a drove of cattle, and he was turning in for a glass. It's the king's daughter. They're bothering the life out of me to marry her. You're the lucky fellow. I'd give something to be in your shoes. Do you see that now? 
Wouldn't it be a fine thing for a farmer to be marrying a princess all dressed in gold and jewels? Jewels, do you say? Ah, now, couldn't you take me with you? Well, you're an honest fellow, and I don't care for the king's daughter, though she's as beautiful as the day and is covered with jewels from top to toe. You shall have her. Just undo the cord and let me out. They tied me up tight as they knew I'd run away from her. Out crawled Donald. In crept the farmer. Now lie still and don't mind the shaking. It's only rumbling over the palace steps you'll be, and maybe they'll abuse you for a vagabond who won't have the king's daughter, but you needn't mind that. Ah, uh, it's a deal I'm giving up for you, sure as it is that I don't care for the princess. Take my cattle in exchange, said the farmer, and you may guess it wasn't long before Donald was at their tails driving them homewards. Out came Hudden and Dudden, and the one took one end of the pole, and the other, the other. I'm thinking he's heavier, said Hudden. Ah, uh, never mind, said Dudden. It's only a step now to the Browns Lake. I'll have her now, I'll have her now, bawled the farmer from inside the sack. By my faith, and you shall, though, said Hudden, and he laid his stick across the sack. I'll have her, I'll have her, bawled the farmer louder than ever. Well, here you are, said Dudden, for they were now come to the Brown Lake and unslinging the sack, they pitched it plump into the lake. You'll not be playing your tricks on us any longer, said Hudden. True for you, said Dudden. Ah, Donald, my boy, it was an ill day when you borrowed my scales. Off they went with a light step and an easy heart. But when they were near home, who should they see but Donald O'Neary? And all around him, the cows were grazing, and the calves were kicking up their heels and butting their heads together. Is it you, Donald? said Dudden. Faith, you've been quicker than we have. True for you, Dudden, and let me thank you kindly. The turn was good, if the will was ill. You'll have heard, like me, that Brown Lake leads to the land of promise. I always put it down to lies, but it is just as true as my word. Look at the cattle. Hudden stared, and Dudden gaped, but they couldn't get over the cattle. Fine, fat cattle they were, too. It's only the worst I could bring up with me, said Donald O'Neary. The others were so fat. There was no driving them. Faith, too. It's little wonder they didn't care to leave, with grass as far as you could see and as sweet and juicy as fresh butter. Ah, now, Donald, we haven't always been friends, said Dudden. But as I was just saying, you were ever a decent lad, and you'll show us the way, won't you? I don't see that I'm called upon to do that. There is a power more cattle down there. Why shouldn't I have them all to myself? Faith, they may well say, the richer you get, the harder the heart. You always were a neighborly lad, Donald. You wouldn't wish to keep the luck all to yourself. True for you, Hudden, though tis a bad example you set me. But I'll not be thinking of old times. There is plenty for all there, so come along with me. Off they trudged with a light heart and eager step. When they came to the brown lake, the sky was full of little white clouds. And if the sky was full, the lake was full. Ah! Now look, there they are, cried Donald as he pointed to the clouds in the lake. Where? Where? cried Hudden. And don't be greedy, cried Dudden, as he jumped his hardest to be up first with the fat cattle. But if he jumped first, Hudden wasn't long behind. They never came back. Maybe they got too fat like the cattle. As for Donald O'Neary, he had cattle and sheep all his days to his heart's content. End of Hudden and Dudden and Donald O'Neary by Joseph Jacobs How the Wicked Sons Were Duped In Indian Fairy Tales by Joseph Jacobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Shobha How the Wicked Sons Were Duped A very wealthy old man, imagining that he was on the point of death, sent for his sons and divided his property among them. However, he did not die for several years afterwards, and miserable years many of them were. Besides the weariness of old age, 
the old fellow had to bear with much abuse and cruelty from his sons. Wretched, selfish ingrates! Previously, they vied with one another in trying to please their father, hoping thus to receive more money. But now, they had received their patrimony. They cared not how soon he left them. Nay, the sooner the better, because he was only a needless trouble and expense. And they let the poor old man know what they felt. One day, he met a friend and related to him all his troubles. The friend sympathized very much with him and promised to think over the matter and call in a little while and tell him what to do. He did so. In a few days, he visited the old man and put down four bags full of stones and gravel before him. Look here, friend, he said. Your sons will get to know of my coming here today and will inquire about it. You must pretend that I came to discharge a long-standing debt with you and that you are several thousands of rupees richer than you thought you were. Keep these bags in your own hands and on no account let your sons get to them as long as you are alive. You will soon find them change their conduct towards you. Salam. I will come again soon to see how you are getting on. When the young men got to hear of this further increase of wealth, they began to be more attentive and pleasing to their father than ever before. And thus they continued to the day of the old man's demise. When the bags were greedily opened and found to contain only stones and gravel. End of How the Wicked Sons Were Duped by Joseph Jacobs Three Selections from the Celtic Twilight by William Butler Yeats This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Three Old Burns and the Evil Fairies in the dim kingdom there is a great abundance of all excellent things. There is more love there than upon the earth. There is more dancing there than upon the earth. And there is more treasure there than upon the earth. In the beginning, the earth was perhaps made to fulfill the desire of man. But now it has got old and fallen into decay. What wonder if we try and pilfer the treasures of that other kingdom? A friend was once at the village near Sleeve League. One day he was straying about a rath called Cashel Noor. A man with a haggard face and unkempt hair, and clothes falling in pieces, came into the rath and began digging. My friend turned to a peasant who was working near and asked who the man was. That is the third O'Burn, was the answer. A few days after he learned this story, a great quantity of treasure had been buried in the wrath in pagan times, and a number of evil fairies set to guard it, but some day it was to be found and belonged to the family of the O'Burns. Before that day three O'Burns must find it and die. Two had already done so. The first had dug and dug until at last he got a glimpse of the stone coffin that contained it. But immediately a thing like a huge hairy dog came down the mountain and tore him to pieces. The next morning the treasure had again vanished deep into the earth. The second O'Byrne came and dug and dug until he found the coffer, and lifted the lid and saw the gold shining within. He saw some horrible sight the next moment, and went raving mad and soon died. The treasure again sank out of sight. The third O'Byrne is now digging. He believes that he will die in some terrible way the moment he finds the treasure, but that the spell will be broken, and the O'Byrne family made rich forever, as they were of old. A peasant of the neighborhood once saw the treasure. He found the shin bone of a hare lying on the grass. He took it up. There was a hole in it. He looked through the hole and saw the gold heaped up under the ground. He hurried home to bring a spade. But when he got to the wrath, again he could not find the spot where he had seen it. 
drum cliff and rosses drum cliff and rosses were are and ever shall be please heaven places of unearthly resort i have lived near by them and in them time after time and have gathered thus many a crumb of fairy lore drumcliff is a wide green valley lying at the foot of ben bulbin the mountain in whose side the square white door swings open at nightfall to loose the fairy riders on the world the great saint columba himself the builder of many of the old ruins in the valley climbed the mountains on one notable day to get near heaven with his prayers rosses is a little sea dividing sandy plain covered with short grass like a green tablecloth and lying in the foam midway between the round carn headed knocknaria and ben bulbin famous for hawks but for ben bulbin and knocknaria many a poor salad be cast away as the rhyme goes at the northern corner of rosses is a little promontory of sand and rocks and grass a mournful haunted place no wise peasant would fall asleep under its low cliff for he who sleeps here may wake silly the good people having carried off his soul there is no more ready short cut to the dim kingdom than this plovery head land for covered and smothered now from sight by mounds of sand a long cave goes thither full of gold and silver and the most beautiful parlors and drawing-rooms once before the sand covered it a dog strayed in and was heard yelping helplessly deep underground in a fort far inland these forts or wraths made before modern history had begun cover all rosses and all column kill the one where the dog yelped has like most others an underground beehive chamber in the midst once when i was poking about there an unusually intelligent and reading peasant who had come with me and waited outside knelt down by the opening and whispered in a timid voice are you all right sir i had been some little while underground and he feared i had been carried off like the dog no wonder he was afraid for the fort has long been circled by ill-boding rumors it is on the ridge of a small hill on whose northern slope lie a few stray cottages one night a farmer's young son came from one of them and saw the fort all flaming and ran towards it but the glamour fell on him and he sprang on to a fence cross-legged and commenced beating it with a stick for he imagined the fence was a horse and that all night long he went on the most wonderful ride through the country in the morning he was still beating his fence and they carried him home where he remained a simpleton for three years before he came to himself again a little later a farmer tried to level the fort his cows and horses died and all manner of trouble overtook him and finally he himself was led home and left useless with his head on his knees by the fire to the day of his death a few hundred yards southwards of the northern angle of rosses is another angle having also its cave though this one is not covered with sand about twenty years ago a brig was wrecked near by and three or four fishermen were put to watch the deserted hulk through the darkness at midnight they saw sitting on a stone at the cave's mouth two red-capped fiddlers fiddling with all their might the men fled a great crowd of villagers rushed down to the cave to see the fiddlers but the creatures had gone to the wise peasant the green hills and woods round him are full of never-fading mystery when the aged country woman stands at her door in the evening and in her own words looks at the mountains and thinks of the goodness of god god is all the nearer because the pagan powers are not far because northward in ben bulbin famous for hawks the white square door swings open at sundown and those wild unchristian riders rush forth upon the fields while southward the white lady who is doubtless mauve herself wonders under the broad cloud nightcap of knocknaria how may she doubt these things even though the priest shakes his head at her 
did not a herd boy no long while since see the white lady she passed so close that the skirt of her dress touched him he fell down and was dead three days but this is merely the small gossip of fairydom the little stitches that join this world and the other one night as i sat eating mrs h s soda bread her husband told me a longish story much the best of all i heard in ross's many a poor man from fen im cool to our own days has had some such adventure to tell of for those creatures the good people love to repeat themselves at any rate the story-tellers do in the times when we used to travel by the canal he said i was coming down from dublin when we came to mullingar the canal ended and i began to walk and stiff and fatigued i was after the slowness i had some friends with me and now and then we walked now and then we rode in a cart so on till we saw some girls milking cows and stopped to joke with them after a while we asked them for a drink of milk we have nothing to put it in here they said but come to the house with us we went home with them and sat round the fire talking after a while the others went and left me loath to stir from the good fire i asked the girls for something to eat there was a pot on the fire and they took the meat out and put it on a plate and told me to eat only the meat that came off the head when i had eaten the girls went out and i did not see them again it grew darker and darker and there i still sat loath as ever to leave the good fire and after a while two men came in carrying between them a corpse when i saw them coming i hid behind the door says one to the other putting the corpse on the spit who'll turn the spit says the other michael h come out of that and turn the meat i came out all of a tremble and began turning the spit michael h says the one who spoke first if you let it burn we'll have to put you on the spit instead and on that they went out I sat there trembling and turning the corpse till towards midnight. The men came again, and the one said it was burnt, and the other said it was done right. But having fallen out over it, they both said they would do me no harm that time. And, sitting by the fire, one of them cried out, Michael H., can you tell me a story? Devil a one, said I, on which he caught me by the shoulder and put me out like a shot it was a wild blowing night never in all my born days did i see such a night the darkest night that ever came out of the heavens i did not know where i was for the life of me so when one of the men came after me and touched me on the shoulder with a michael h can you tell a story now i can says i in he brought me and putting me by the fire says begin i have no story but the one says i that i was sitting here and you two men brought in a corpse and put it on the spit and set me turning it that will do says he ye may go in there and lie down on the bed and i went nothing loath and in the morning where was i but in the middle of a green field drumcliff is a great place for omens before a prosperous fishing season a herring barrel appears in the midst of a storm cloud and at a place called Cullumkill's strand a place of marsh and mire an ancient boat with saint columba himself comes floating in from sea on a moonlight night a portent of a brave harvesting they have their dread portents too some few seasons ago a fisherman saw far on the horizon renowned high brazil where he who touches shall find no more labor or care nor cynic laughter but shall go walking about under shadiest boss cage and enjoy the conversation of cuchulain and his heroes a vision of high brazil forebodes national troubles drumcliff and rosses are choke full of ghosts by bog road wrath hillside sea border they gather in all shapes headless women men in armor shadow hares fire-tongued hounds whistling seals 
and so on. A whistling seal sank a ship the other day. At Drumcliff there is a very ancient graveyard. The annals of the four masters have this verse about a soldier named Dinad Ak, who died in 871. A pious soldier of the race of Khan lies under hazel crosses at Drumcliff. Not very long ago an old woman, turning to go into the churchyard at night to pray, saw standing before her a man in armor, who asked her where she was going. It was the pious soldier of the race of Khan, says local wisdom, still keeping watch with his ancient piety over the graveyard. Again, the custom is still common hereabouts of sprinkling the doorstep with the blood of a chicken on the death of a very young child. Thus, as belief is, drawing into the blood the evil spirits from the too weak soul. Blood is a great gatherer of evil spirits. To cut your hand on a stone on going into a fort is said to be very dangerous. There is no more curious ghost in Drumcliff or Rosses than the snipe ghost. There is a bush behind a house in a village that I know well. For excellent reasons, I do not say whether in Drumcliff or Rosses or on the slope of Ben Bulbin or even on the plain round Naknaria. There is a history concerning the house in the bush. A man once lived there who found on the quay of Sligo a package containing 300 pounds in notes. It was dropped by a foreign sea captain. This my man knew, but said nothing. It was money for freight, and the sea captain, not daring to face his owners, committed suicide in mid-ocean. Shortly afterwards my man died. His soul could not rest. At any rate, strange sounds were heard round his house, though that had grown and prospered since the freight money. The wife was often seen by those still alive out in the garden praying at the bush I have spoken of, for the shade of the dead man appeared there at times. The bush remains to this day, once portion of a hedge. It now stands by itself, for no one dare put a spade or pruning knife about it. As to the strange sounds and voices, they did not cease till a few years ago, when, during some repairs, a snipe flew out of the solid plaster and away. The troubled ghost, say the neighbors, of the note finder was at last dislodged. My forebears and relations have lived near Ross's and Drumcliff these many years. A few miles northward I am wholly a stranger and can find nothing. When I ask for stories of the fairies, my answer is some such as was given me by a woman who lives near a white stone fort, one of the few stone ones in Ireland, under the seaward angle of Ben Bulbin. They always mind their own affairs, and I always mind mine, for it is dangerous to talk of the creatures. Only friendship for yourself or knowledge of your forebears will loosen these cautious tongues. My friend, the sweet harp string, I give no more than his Irish name for fear of gougers, has the science of unpacking the stubbornest heart. But then he supplies the potheen makers with grain from his own fields. Besides, he is descended from a noted Gaelic magician who raised the dell in great Eliza's century, and he has a kind of prescriptive right to hear tell of all kind of other world creatures. They are almost relations of his, if all people say concerning the parentage of magicians be true. The Religion of a Sailor A sea captain, when he stands upon the bridge, or looks out from his deckhouse, thinks much about God and about the world. Away in the valley yonder, among the corn and the poppies, men may well forget all things except the warmth of the sun upon the face and the kind shadow under the hedge. But he who journeys through storm and darkness must needs think and think. One July, a couple of years ago, I took my supper with a Captain Moran on board the S.S. Margaret that had put into a western river from I know not where. I found him a man of many notions, all flavored with his personality, as is the way with sailors. He talked in his queer sea manner of God in the world, and up through all his words broke the hard energy of his calling. Sir, said he, 
did you ever hear tell of the sea captain's prayer no said i what is it it is he replied o oh lord give me a stiff upper lip and what does that mean it means he said that when they come to me some night and wake me up and say captain we're going down that i won't make a fool o meself why sir we war in mid-atlantic and i standin on the bridge when the third mate comes up to me lookin mortial bad says he captain all's up with us says i didn't you know when you joined that a certain percentage go down every year yes sir says he and says i aren't you paid to go down yes sir says he and says i then go down like a man and be damned to you end of three stories from celtic twilight by william butler yeats The Gnomes Road in the Crystal Palace and Other Legends by Mary H. Frary and Charles Maurice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gnomes Road On the high hill above the Rhine still stand the ruins of an old castle. Here, Kuno von Sein once lived. Kuno was a very proud young man, for he was a member of a very noble family. He had fallen in love with the beautiful daughter of the surly old lord of Falkenstein. At last, he succeeded in winning the love of the maiden, but of her father he had great fear. After many months of hoping and fearing, he decided to go to the old lord and ask for his daughter's hand. One beautiful morning, he set out on his mission to the castle of Falkenstein. The castle was perched far up on the heights that rose above a small river. It was a long journey, and he had almost lost his courage when he reached the place. However, he went at once into the presence of the lord of Falkenstein and boldly made known his wish. The grim old lord looked at him long and closely. Then in tones that were terrible to poor Kuno spoke. I will, he said, consider the matter if you will promise to do one thing for me. Without waiting to find out what he was to do, Kuno eagerly consented. Then, said the Lord of Falkenstein, you may wed my daughter on condition that you build a convenient road over the jagged rock to the village. You are to ride up that road on your war horse before sunrise tomorrow morning. Poor Kuno was speechless. Nothing was to be said, for he knew how impossible was the task. Many months of hard labor would scarcely accomplish the great work. Sadly, he made his way down the rocks again. He had not been able to catch even a glimpse of the fair Armingrad, his beloved. So he sat down upon a rock in the valley and began to reproach himself for his stupidity. Suddenly, he was aroused from his thoughts by a small voice calling to him. Kuno, Kuno von Sein, it said. He looked up, and there before him stood the king of the gnomes. Despair not, said the kindly little man, myself and my subjects will gladly help so good a knight, so away to the inn where you left your steed, before sunrise tomorrow morning the road shall be ready. At this the king of the gnomes waved his hand, a great mist rose and covered the hill and the valley with its dense vapor. Thousands of dwarf-like creatures now sprang out of the ground on all sides. They began using axes, hammers, and spades with great good will. All night long, Kuno von Sein heard the crashing of great forest trees and the breaking of stones. Now and then he heard a loud rumble like thunder. There was a continual clatter and crashing throughout the whole night. At dawn, he came from his room and was greeted by the innkeeper. A great storm must have raged over the valley last night, said the latter. I was kept awake all night by the noise. Kuno did not pause to listen to the man's tales, but loudly called for his horse. He mounted and rode rapidly away to the foot of the mountain. 
Far above him loomed the castle of Valkenstein. How Kuno's heart leaped with joy. There indeed was a road leading up to the castle. True to his promise, the king of the gnomes had built a broad, convenient road through the forest and over the rocks. Kuno galloped boldly up, exchanging smiles with the kindly dwarfs, who peered at him from behind every rock and tree. From the rampart of the castle stepped the beautiful Armingrad. Kuno dashed over the arched bridge the dwarfs were just finishing and greeted her gaily. The dwarfs raised a glad shout of Trump. The knight of Vulcanstein was awakened by the shout. He looked out, and there, stretching far out from the castle, saw the newly built road. He thought he must still be dreaming, and rubbed his eyes again and again. When, however, he saw the beaming face of Armingrad and Kuno, he knew that he had been outwitted. So as the first sunbeam fell upon the castle, lighting up the gladdened heart and blushing cheeks of the maiden, Kuno claimed her as his bride. The lord of Falkenstein was proud to accept a man who could do such wonderful things as Kuno had accomplished during the night. End of the Gnome's Road Read to you by Tariq al -Yahya. The Wonderful Tea Kettle in Japanese Fairy World by William Elliot Griffiths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Colleen McMahon. The Wonderful Tea Kettle by William Elliot Griffiths. A long time ago, there was an old priest who lived in the temple of Morinji in the province of Hitachi. He cooked his own rice, boiled his own tea, swept his own floor, and lived frugally, as an honest priest should do. One day, he was sitting near the square fireplace in the middle of the floor. A rope and chain to hold the pot and kettle hung down from the covered hole in the ceiling, which did duty as a chimney. A pair of brass tongs was stuck in the ashes, and the fire blazed merrily. At the side of the fireplace, on the floor, was a tray filled with tiny teacups, a pewter tea caddy, a bamboo tea stirrer, and a little dipper. The priest, Having finished sweeping the ashes off the edges of the hearth with a little whisk of hawk's feathers, was just about to put on the tea when zuz zuz sang the tea kettle spout, and then patati patati said the lid as it flapped up and down and the kettle swung backwards and forwards. What does this mean? said the old bonze. Naruhodo said he with a start as the spout of the kettle turned into a badger's nose with its big whiskers while from the other side sprouted out a long, bushy tail. Yohodo Mezurashi! shouted the priest, dropping the tea caddy and spilling the green tea all over the matting, as four hairy legs appeared under the kettle, and the strange compound, half badger and half kettle, jumped off the fire and began running around the room. To the priest's horror, it leaped on a shelf, puffed out its belly, and began to beat a tune with its forepaws as if it were a drum. The old Bonze's pupils, hearing the racket, rushed in, and after a lively chase, upsetting piles of books and breaking some of the teacups, secured the badger, and squeezed him in a keg used for storing the pickled radishes called daikon, or Japanese sauerkraut. They fastened down the lid with a heavy stone. They were sure that the strong odor of the radishes would kill the beast, for no man could possibly survive such a smell, and it was not likely a badger could. The next morning, the tinker of the village called in, and the priest told him about his strange visitor. Wishing to show him the animal, he cautiously lifted the lid of the cask, lest the badger might after all be still alive, in spite of the stench of the sour mess, when, lo, there was nothing but the old iron tea kettle. Fearing that the utensil might play the same prank again, the priest was glad to sell it to the tinker, who bought the kettle for a few iron cash. He carried it to his junk shop, though he thought it felt unusually heavy. The tinker went to bed as usual that night with his andon, or paper-shaded lamp, just to the back of his head. About midnight, hearing a strange noise like the flapping up and down of an iron pot lid, he sat up in bed, rubbed his eyes, and there was the iron pot, 
covered with fur and sprouting out legs. In short, it was turning into a hairy beast. Going over to the recess and taking a fan from the rack, the badger climbed up on the frame of the lamp and began to dance on its one hind leg, waving the fan with its forepaw. It played many other tricks until the man started up, and then the badger turned into a tea kettle again. I declare, said the tinker, as he woke up next morning and talked the matter over with his wife, I'll just raise a mountain, earn my fortune, on this kettle. It certainly is a very highly accomplished tea kettle. I'll call it the Bambuku Chagama, the tea kettle accomplished in literature and military art, and exhibit it to the public. So the tinker hired a professional showman for his business agent and built a little theater and stage. Then he gave an order to a friend of his, an artist, to paint scenery, with Fujiyama and cranes flying in the air, and a crimson sun shining through the bamboo, and a red moon rising over the waves, and golden clouds and tortoises, and the sumiyoshi couple, and the grasshopper's picnic, and the procession of Lord Longlegs, and such like. Then he stretched a tight rope of rice straw across the stage, and the handbills being stuck up in all the barber shops in town, and wooden tickets branded with Accomplished and Lucky Tea Kettle Performance, Admit One, the show was opened. The house was full, and people came in parties, bringing their teapots full of tea, and picnic boxes full of rice and eggs and dumplings, made of millet meal, sugared roast pea cakes and other refreshments, because they came to stay all day. Mothers brought their babies with them, for the children enjoyed it most of all. Then the tinker, dressed up in his wide ceremonial clothes, with a big fan in his hand, came out on the platform, made his bow, and set the wonderful tea kettle on the stage. Then, at a wave of his fan, the kettle ran around on four legs, half badger and half iron, clanking its lid and wagging its tail. Next, it turned into a badger, swelled out its body, and beat a tune on it like a drum. It danced a jig on the tightrope, and walked the slack rope holding a fan or an umbrella in his paw, stood on his head, and finally, at a flourish of his master's fan, became a cold and rusty tea kettle again. The audience were wild with delight, and as the fame of the wonderful tea kettle spread, many people came from great distances. Year after year, the tinker exhibited the wonder until he grew immensely rich. Then he retired from the show business, and out of gratitude took the old kettle to the temple again, and deposited it there as a precious relic. It was then named Bambuku Daimyojin, the great illustrious, accomplished in literature and the military art. End of The Wonderful Tea Kettle by William Elliot Griffiths Recorded by Colleen McMahon The Story of King Arthur, of Arthur's Birth and How He Became King and the Round Table, from the Junior Classics, Volume 4, Heroes and Heroines of Chivalry, edited by William Patton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jessica West. The Story of King Arthur this great treasure house of stories is to the English race what the stories of Ulysses and Ananias were to the Greeks and Latins, a national inheritance of which they should be, and are proud. The high nobility, dauntless courage, and gentle humility of Arthur and his knights have had a great effect in the molding the character of English peoples, since none of us can help trying to imitate what he admires and loves most. As a series of pictures of life in the Middle Ages, the stories are of the greatest value. The geography is confused as it is in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and facts are sometimes mixed with magic, but modern critics believe there was a real author who lived about the year 500 A.D. Of Author's Birth and How He Became King, retold by Beatrice Clay. Long years ago there ruled over Britain a king called Uther Pendragon. A mighty prince was he, and feared by all men. Yet when he sought the love of the fair Egraine of Cornwall, she would have naught to do with him. So that, from grief and disappointment, Uther fell sick and at last seemed like to die. Now in those days there lived a famous magician named Merlin, so powerful that he could change his form at will, or even make himself invisible. Nor was there any place so remote that he could not reach it at once. 
merely by wishing himself there. One day, suddenly, he stood at Uther's bedside and said, Sir King, I know thy grief, and I am ready to help thee. Only promise to give me, at his birth, the son that shall be born to thee, and thou shalt have thy heart's desire. To this the king agreed joyfully, and Merlin kept his word, for he gave Uther the form of one whom Ingrid had loved dearly, and so she took him willingly for her husband. When the time had come that a child should be born to the king and queen, Merlin appeared before Uther to remind him of his promise, and Uther swore it should be as he had said. Three days later a prince was born, and with pomp and ceremony was christened by the name of Arthur, but immediately thereafter the king commanded that the child should be carried to the postern gate, there to be given to the old man who would be found waiting without. Not long after, Uther fell sick, and he knew that his end was come, so by Merlin's advice he called together his knights and barons and said to them, My death draws near. I charge you, therefore, that ye obey my son, even as ye have obeyed me, and my curse upon him, if he claim not the crown when he is a man grown. Then the king turned his face to the wall and died. Scarcely was Uther laid in his grave before disputes arose. Few of the nobles had seen Arthur or even heard of him, and not one of them would have been willing to be ruled by a child. Rather, each thought himself fitted to be king, and strengthening his own castle, made war on his neighbors until confusion alone was supreme, and the poor groaned because there was none to help them. Now when Merlin carried away Arthur, for Merlin was the old man who had stood at the postern gate, he had known all that would happen and had taken the child to keep him safe from the fierce barons until he should be of age to rule wisely and well, and perform all the wonders prophesied of him. He gave the child to the care of the good knight Sir Ector to bring up with his son Kay, but revealed not to him that it was the son of Uther Pendragon that was given into his charge. At last, when years had passed and Arthur had grown a tall youth, well skilled in knightly exercises, Merlin went to the Archbishop of Canterbury and advised him that he should call together at Christmas time all the chief men of the realm of the great cathedral in London. For, said Merlin, there shall be a great marvel by which it shall be made clear to all men who is the lawful king of this land. The Archbishop did as Merlin counseled. Under pain of a fearful curse, he bade the barons and knights come to London to keep the feast, and to pray heaven to send peace to the realm. The people hastened to obey the archbishop's commands, and from all sides, barons and knights came riding in to keep the birth feast of our Lord. And when they had prayed, and were coming forth from the cathedral, they saw a strange sight. There, in the open space before the church, stood a great stone, an anvil thrust with the sword, and on the stone were written these words, Whoso draw forth this sword is rightful king of Britain born. At once there was fierce quarrels, each man clamoring to be the first to try his fortune, none doubting his success. Then the archbishop decreed that each should make the venture in turn, from the greatest baron to the least knight, and each in turn, having put forth his utmost strength, failed to move the sword one inch, and drew back ashamed. So the archbishop dismissed the company, and having appointed guards to watch over the stone, sent messengers through all the land to give word of the great joust to be held in London at Easter, when each knight could give proof of his skill and courage, and try whether the adventure of the sword was for him. Among those who rode to London at Easter was the good Sir Ector, and with him his son Sir Kay, newly made a knight and the young author. When the morning came that the joust should begin, Sir Kay and Arthur mounted their horses and set out for the lists. But before they reached the field, Kay looked and saw that he had left his sword behind. Immediately, Arthur turned back to fetch it for him, only to find the house fast shut, for all were gone to view the tournament. Sore vexed was Arthur, fearing lest his brother Kay should lose his chance of gaining glory, till of a sudden he bethought of him of the sword and the great anvil before the cathedral. Thither he rode with all speed, and the guards, having deserted their posts to view the tournament, there was none to forbid him the adventure. He leaped from his horse, seized the hilt, and instantly drew forth the sword as easily as from a scabbard. Then, mounting his horse, and thinking no marvel what he had done, he rode after his brother and handed him the weapon. When Kay looked at it, he saw at once that it was the wondrous sword from the stone. In great joy he sought his father, and showing it to him said, Then must I be king of Britain. But Sir Ector bade him say how he came by the sword, 
and when Sir Kay told him Arthur had brought it to him, Sir Ector bent his knee to the boy and said, Sir, I perceive that ye are my king, and here I tender you my homage. And Kay did add as his father. Then the three sought the bishop, to whom they related all that had happened, and he, much marveling, called the people together to the great stone, and bade Arthur thrust back the sword and draw it forth again in the presence of all, which he did with ease. But an angry murmur arose from the barons, who cried that what a boy could do, a man could do. So at the archbishop's word, the sword was put back, and each man, whether baron or knight, tried in his turn to draw it forth and failed. Then for the third time, Arthur drew forth the sword. Immediately there rose from the people a great shout, Arthur is king! Arthur is king! We will have no king but Arthur! And though the barons scowled and threatened, they fell on their knees before him while the archbishop placed the crown upon his head and swore to obey him faithfully as their lord and sovereign. Thus Arthur was made king, and to all he did justice, righting wrongs and giving to all their dues. Nor was he forgetful of those that had been his friends. For Kay, whom he loved as a brother, he made central and a chief of his household, and to Sir Ector, his foster father, he gave him broad lands. The Round Table, retold by Beaches Clay. Thus Arthur was made king, but he had to fight for his own, for eleven great kings drew together and refused to acknowledge him as their lord, and chief among the rebels was King Lot of Orkney, who had married Arthur's sister, Bellicent. By Merlin's advice, Arthur had sent for help overseas to ban and Bors the two great kings who ruled in Gaul. With their aid, he overthrew his foes in a great battle near the River Trent, and then he passed with them into their own lands and helped them drive out their enemies. So there was ever great friendship between Arthur and the king, bands and boars, and all their kindred, and afterward some of the most famous knights of the Round Table were of that kin. Then King Arthur set himself to restore order throughout his kingdom. To all who would submit and amend their evil ways, he showed kindness. Those who persisted in oppression and wrong he removed, putting in their place others who would deal justly with the people. And because the land had become overrun with forests during the days of misrule, he cut roads through the thickets that no longer wild beasts and men, fiercer than the beast, should lurk in their gloom to the harm of the weak and defenseless. Thus it came to pass that soon the peasant plowed his fields in safety, and where had been waste, men dwelt again in peace and prosperity. Among the lesser kings whom Arthur helped rebuild their towns and restore order was Queen Leo de Grants of Camelard. Now Leo de Grants had one fair child, his daughter, Guinevere, and from the first he saw her, Arthur gave her all his love. So he sought counsel of Merlin, his chief adviser. Merlin heard the king sorrowfully, and he said, Sir King, when a man's heart is set, he may not change. Yet had it been well if he had loved another. So the king sent his knights to Leo de Grance to ask him his daughter, and Leo de Grance consented, rejoicing to wed her to so good and knightly a king. With great pomp, the princess was conducted to Canterbury, and there the king met her, and they too were wed by the archbishop in the great cathedral amid the rejoicings of the people. On that same day did Arthur found his order of the round table, the fame of which was to spread throughout Christendom, and endure through all time. Now the round table had been made for King Uther Pendragon by Merlin, who had meant thereby to set forth plainly to all men the roundness of the earth. After Uther died, King Leo de Grance had possessed it, but when Arthur was wed, he sent it to him as a gift, and great was the king's joy at receiving it. One hundred and fifty knights might take their places about it, and for them Merlin made sieges or seats. One hundred and twenty-eight did Arthur knight at that great feast. Thereafter, if any sieges were empty, at the high festival of Pentecost, new knights were ordained to fill them, and by magic was the name of each knight found inscribed, and letters of gold in his proper siege. One seat only long remained unoccupied, and that was the siege perilous. No knight might occupy it until the coming of Sir Galahad, for without danger to his life, None might sit there who was not free from all stain of sin. With pomp and ceremony did each knight take upon him the vows of true knighthood to obey the king, to show mercy to all who asked it, 
to defend the weak, and for no worldly gain to fight in the wrongful cause. And all the knights rejoiced together, doing honor to Arthur and to his queen. Then they rode forth to right the wrong and help the oppressed, and by their aid the king held his realm in peace, doing justice to all. End of the Round Table